an entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage Podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please, sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today I got a pretty amazing guest on. This guy has accomplished more um, in the last decade than like most people that I've ever come across. He is Michael Chernow. He's a chef, entrepreneur, and founder of Seymour's, co-founder of The Meatball Shop, and co-founder of Well Well. And he's quite literally the modern day renaissance man. But what I love most about him is he's really into fitness and fitness helped to save his life from the depths of addiction and which we will definitely get into. Uh, But Michael, I just wanted to first welcome you to the show. Man, thank you so much for having me uh, and for that kind intro. (laughs) Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to me. Like the people I bring on are just people that have really taken something negative and shifted it into something extremely positive, which I know you have done, which we'll get into a bit later. But we were talking before the show about quarantine, and we were talking about you know the pandemic, and we were t- chatting about you know what was going on. So, like, what's going on with you right now? How has your life adjusted since this whole COVID thing hit? Um, you know, it's a good question. I, well, I, um, you know, I, I, I essentially, I'm a born and raised New York City guy, so I was born and raised in Manhattan. Uh, I've, I've lived in Brooklyn for the last uh, 15 years. Um, I never thought that leaving the city was something that I was going to do. I've got two young kids. I've got two boys, uh, that I, you know, like I'm from the city. I I wanted them to be from the city. Um, but since this COVID thing happened, um, I have not turned my back on my hometown, but I have certainly, um, opened up to a broader sort of vision for what the future could look like for me and my family. And so we have a, a, a house outside of the city uh, that is incredible. And uh, we made a decision to, instead of like upgrade our apartment when we had a second child to say, hey, let's actually spend half the amount of money that we would spend upgrading our apartment and buy a place out of the city so that we have a place to take the kids on the weekends with a lot more space than we would potentially have in the city. Um, and so we did that and, and it was the best decision we've ever made because uh, we've been out of the city for the last uh, nine and a half weeks or actually today is 10 weeks or so two and a half months. Um, and our boys are in heaven and we are getting real comfortable up here. Um, you know, look, this virus is ravished uh, every there's not a human being on the planet that's not impacted by this whole thing it's it's a terrible uh catastrophic thing my grandfather is unfortunately in critical condition he contracted the virus on friday of last week uh in his nursing home and um he's 98 so you know he's lived a very fruitful life it's a shame that you know, this is potentially what, what could what could end it for him. Um, and my family's sort of really bummed out about that, of course. Uh, so I, I, you know, the virus has is, is been, it's just, it's, 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 it's catastrophic. However, I am a positive, optimistic, like, to, like probably, you know, to a fault. Um, and so I find the silver lining in everything. And I also try to make lemonade whenever I, see lemons and um and you know i'm i'm in this time i'm i'm actually i'm out here just trying to make some lemonade and uh you know i but my grandfather's situation how i look at that is my grandfather's 98 he was uh born in 1919 wow. he lives through the, the you know the rolling the roaring 20s the great depression fought in world war ii created awesome businesses failed at some businesses you know, spent time in Florida, you know, like my grandfather lived this amazing, fruitful life. He's 98 years old. His number one priority was great relationships with people. He had an amazing just network of friends. And I I, I say, you know, he lived an amazing, incredible life, one that I aspire to. So that's that's why I'm finding the silver lining in that. And 
in 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 the in the world in general you know we needed a fucking reset man mm. we needed a you know we needed to pump the brakes like and you know you said i you know when you the way you introduced me is i've done a lot in the last 10 years and and you're right i have in uh, uh, but i also think that so i i appreciate you saying that but it it's it's not, it, it hasn't been the healthiest. You know what I'm saying? Like I have been, I, and I don't think I'll ever not be like a pedal to the metal guy because I am just extreme in anything I do. I'm an, I'm an addict, you know what I mean? Like I'm, a, I'm an extreme person. But you know, when it comes to business and work, like I've been nose to the grindstone nonstop mm -hmm. for the last 11 years. And this, this time has forced me to slow down to not beat myself up for not, you know, producing an enormous amount of shit every day, uh, to slow down, to, to hold my son uh, for more than two minutes when I see him in the morning, you know, like I needed this, I, I needed it. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of people needed to, to take a step back and, and understand what life is actually all about. And I think it's ultimately about love. The human beings were, Put on the planet to love and be loved at the end of the day right like i drank and did drugs because i wanted to be loved uh and learn how to love myself and and i think everything that we do at the core of 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 the motivation or lack of motivation is is uh the the, the desire to love and be loved yeah, it's so true and you bring up so many like interesting points that I think a lot of people need to hear. Like we all kind of need a reset. I mean, even like during this pandemic in isolation or wherever our case is, like we're having to look at ourselves and it's like, okay, like what are some areas in my life that I've been like neglecting? Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's, you know, just the way you carry yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe it's like your outlook, whatever it is. And I think it's during times like this, when we get the reset, where we're able to kind of propel forward. You know, and I know something that's, that's probably very similar for you, like you kind of touched on a little bit was your addiction in your early 20s. I know there was a moment very similar to now where you had this reset where you kind of had to like take a pause and reevaluate some things in your life. You know, you were working at Frank, your bartender, I think, believe the owner kind of came to you and was like, you can either get sober or get your life together or get out. I think if I remember correctly, that's how it was. And then you ended up really rediscovering yourself at that point through, you know, Muay Thai and support groups and that sort of thing. Talk to me about, talk to me about where you were at in your, in your life at that point. Like you mentioned, you know, trying to find, you know, to love yourself with doing drugs and drinking, like what caused you to go down that rabbit hole and how'd you kind of get out of it? Um, well, again, you know, I was, I was born and raised in New York city. Right. And, uh, you know, but, but forgetting that, I mean, I, 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 I've had this sort of uh, more mentality since mm. I, as early as I can remember, you know, like I've always just wanted more of whatever it was, specifically if it was something that took me out of the present moment. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, and I'm even guilty of that to, a, you know, to today at times, you know, I'm, I'm no angel, but um <clears throat> I, I think uh, I, you know, I, I fell in love with escapism uh, and at an early age, I fell in love with it. I, I was, I was, you know, sort of started working in restaurants at 13. So there was no, it was not like uncommon to escape uh, when you're working in the night. And so I worked in the night um, and, uh, and I sort of just acclimated, uh, you know, I took to it like white on rice. I just, I was, it, it was like, it, I was perfect for it. And uh, it just got, it got, you know, there's, there was a bunch of years where it was just super fun. There's, you know, I'm not, like, of course, some yeah. of the best <laughs> times of my life, you know? Uh, and then, and then it stopped, stopped being fun. Um, and uh, you know, I, I started drinking and partying when I was like 13 and then uh, my dad passed away when I was 20 and even though my relationship with my father was absolutely terrible uh, you know my whole life um, I used that as a grand excuse to just take it even further and from 20 to 23 I was on a death march and 
every, you know, but I still, I always had a job. I always can, I always kept a job in a, in a restaurant or a nightclub, whatever it was. Um, you know, and I was always sort of like, um, I enjoyed people. So I was, I was, I, I, I had a lot of friends, uh, you know, like friends. Um, but, uh, yeah, the last few years uh, were were pretty dark, and it was, and I and I I, I stopped enjoying it, um, and it became just like part of my routine. Uh, and I clearly remember just moments where I was just like, I want to die. This is like, it's, I can't believe that I I found myself back here again after promising not to do it again, and. You know, I remember the last day I, I, I was, it was a, it was a Monday morning. I'd probably been up for two days plus. Uh, I had, I had a double at work. I was supposed to be at work at 10 AM. It was in August, um, of, uh, of 2004. And, uh, I was up on the roof with a couple of buddies. They were like, all right, dude, we're done. And I was like, we're done. And they were like, we're done. I went down. I remember clearly catching a glimpse of myself in the mirror looking in the mirror and saying, man, I hate you more than anything on the planet. Mm. And I was like, whoa, like I, I, I couldn't believe that that was the first thought that came to my mind. I hate you. And so I wanted to die. And luckily I didn't kill myself. I woke up 16 hours later, people, I'd locked myself in my room. People thought I had actually died. And uh, my boss, like you said, you know, I slept right through work. Uh, and that that happened pretty regularly, specifically when I had a double. And Frank just said, "Yo, man, Mikey, yeah, I love you to death, man. I, I do. I love you to death. But I can't watch you kill yourself. You're fired." And I and my job was everything. You know, my job was everything to me. I just loved my job, and I lived upstairs, and it was it was a big part of my life. And then uh, I begged him for my job, and he said, "Look, I can't give you your job. You know." bar managing anymore I just can't put you behind the bar but if you get sober if you actually get sober and you come to work at eight o'clock in the morning and you clean the restaurant with the porters for 30 days I'll consider giving you your job back and uh I did it you know um I got to work at eight o'clock in the morning I went to I walked into a room of people that uh took me in like a brother and uh i i understood what they were saying and they understood what i was saying and i quickly learned that like there was a lot of people out there that were dealing with the same shit i was dealing with um so i i, I sort of like really immersed myself in that community very quickly and uh and then a couple of guys from that group uh knew that I had like a, a little bit of a aggressive sort of anger component to, to the end of my story. And they dragged me into a Muay Thai gym and they said, this is where you're going to wake up. We're going to have breakfast. You're going to go, you're going to come meet with us and, and hang with us for about an hour. And then you're going to go over to the gym and train. And then you're going to go home and take a nap. And then you're going to go to work and you're going to eat chicken and broccoli. And I said, whatever it takes, man, I can't want to live like this anymore. And, uh, and very quickly, uh, I started to discover who I was and it wasn't the guy that was, uh, you know, abusing himself constantly. Yeah. It's funny. I see so much of my story and yours, you know, with mine, um, I've been in recovery now for about 11 and a half years. Um, and I was killing myself in my late teens and into my early twenties. And, um, I hit a point where I was, I had an opiate addiction and I was putting three, 400 milligrams of oxy in my nose every day. And, 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 you know, sometimes combining that with like an eight ball of Coke. And I remember crushing up like one line and being like, I wonder if I, if I snort this, will anybody miss me? And if I overdose, will anybody <laughs> miss me? You know, I just sometimes would pray I, that I snorted it and I would never wake up. Cause I'd be like, well, at least I went, I went out like doing what I loved, right. was <laughs> doing drugs. Right. And then I got to, I went, I got incarcerated because I got busted with a bunch of pot and um, the judge kind of gave me something very similar to what, you know, your boss said, I got sentenced to five years, everything suspended, but 90 days, five years probation, 200 hours community service. But he's like, Doug, if you complete everything without messing up, you know, no missed uh, drug tests, no missed probation appointments, I'll take the felony conviction off your record at the end of the five years. And at that point, I'm 20. I'm like, there's no freaking way I'm going to make this. And 
by the grace of God, when I went to jail, my cellmate kind of picked me up and was like, you're going to start working out with me, which was something I'd never done. And then, you know, one push up led to 10. And then it just changed my mindset where I started to develop discipline and commitment and a um, reinvigorated passion for loving myself, that it kind of snowballed into this new passion of what I'm doing now. And so I wanted to ask, like, was it the discipline of exercising in the Muay Thai that kind of helped you like reestablish like commitment to loving yourself on a daily basis? Absolutely. 100% without a question of a doubt. I owe my life to it. Yeah. There's, be- no, there's no doubt. I owe, I, I mean, I, I'm sober for a long time now, you know, I mean, I'm sober almost 16 years. So that is, is uh, that in itself, like, I don't even think about it and I knock on wood. I certainly don't have it licked. I know that it's not, I'm not mm-hmm. like recovered, you know, I'm recovering every day. Right. Um, however, like I, I will say that like, I do not think about drugs and alcohol really ever. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, if, had I not, had I not gotten sober, I had, I would not have found this passion for fitness and wellness. And, you know, and so, you know, when I talk to others, specifically people that are, that are looking to get into, you know, uh, a rhythm of change, uh, and, and incorporate fitness or nutrition, uh, better nutrition into their lives. I tell them very clearly, it is the number, it is my number one priority. And, and for years, sobriety was absolutely my number one priority. And it still is lot neck and neck with fitness, but they go together. Now Mm. I put fitness, I put fitness first and, uh, I don't have fitness without sobriety. And so I get up at five o'clock in the morning to get into the gym, you know, and I have a, I, I'm lucky to have a, a really awesome garage gym up here, but I get up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to get into the gym because I know that that win, that, that win um, sets me up for the day. I am, I feel better inside and uh, anything I do externally is not penet- is is nowhere near as penetrable as 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 an internal good feeling, and so what fitness does for me is it gives me this sort of like this calmness um, and this uh, this feeling of accomplishment very early in the day, and what that does is that makes me a better father, better husband, better business partner, business owner, son, brother. Uh, you know, I, 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 I take, I take an action first thing in the morning after I pray, which is the first thing I do. And, and I, and I get in there and I crush it and, 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 and then I am a lot, and then I put the mask on first, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I put the mask on myself first and then everything comes, uh, it just works out better. And, uh. So the, the Muay Thai, um, starting with Muay Thai, getting my ass literally kicked, like actually, you know, uh, certainly instilled discipline and commitment and fortitude and integrity and, and, uh, and dignity. Uh, it was a great introduction. I mean, I, I played sports as a kid, but like, you know, it was just, I was a kid, uh, you know, as soon as I got into partying and, and, and alcohol, like I just gave up on sports, but, you know, uh, sort of solo you know solo sports like fighting um really uh you know are 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 incredible for the mind like in like i i just and that's why i you know as i've gotten older i i I mean i i I don't compete in muay thai anymore but uh i've just i've I've fallen in love with with weight training because I love to like just get in there, challenge myself every single day, try to get up more weight, take up more reps, and I and I and I have no one else to blame but me if I don't do it, you know. And so I just, yeah, that 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 has set me up. That 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 regimen has set me up for life. Yeah, and what's really crazy is, I I feel the same thing. Like having to 
because we all have this pain, right? We all have pain of shame of hurting others or hurting ourselves or mistakes, looking at the past. And if we don't channel that into something positive, it just kind of sits there, right? And it just kind of just stored in our body and it can really like tear, tear us down. And one of the things that really helped me um, other than weight training has been running and channeling those negative emotions into moving my body and running. And it wasn't so much like, the running a fast mile or running a fast 5k or whatever it was, it was more like a moving, it's more like a moving meditation for me. Like whenever I'm having a bad day or a time where most people or many people who are in that cycle of addiction would think about going and using, I go and I'm like, I'm going to go take a nice long run and ease my mind and clear my thoughts. I know that's big for you. What is it about the running that has kind of really been like part of your saving grace as far as your recovery journey? Um, well, I think, you know, any opportunity you get to, to go outside and breathe air and, uh, and really be with your thoughts, um, is, is, is special and unique. Uh, and so with Muay Thai came running, it was part of the program, you know, I was, mm. they were basically just like, yeah, I mean, if you, you're going to get your ass kicked no matter what. Um, but if you want to get, if you want to get your act ass kicked a little less you should have some good con conditioning so you should start running and so running became a, a big huge part of my life and uh i really love running long distances um and i came up with the meatball shop on runs i came up with seymour's on runs running just sort of gets my creative juices flowing um yeah you know uh i i, I sometimes run with music i sometimes run without anything sometimes i listen to podcasts on my runs but i i would say that if i have to work through something if i'm really struggling with something uh, a great therapy for me is to run uh specifically upstate without any music or headphones um and i just sort of work through shit i lift up rocks and i try to you know i, I try not to intellectualize a lot of things however i do i do like to explore and so running has been just sort of an exploration discovery uh, tool for me um, where I'm able to just get out there, really put some energy into the universe physically and, uh, and, and, and spiritually. And, uh, you know, and then you, you run New York City Marathon and it's one of the best days of your life, you know? Yeah. And it's got to be like so um invigorating when you kind of hit a pinnacle like that where you're like wow I look I look at how far I've come in these last few years in these in this last decade and like wow I'm running marathons I'm competing in bodybuilding competitions I'm doing these things that heck you never thought you would do right and I know like one of the things like I, 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 I see, there's so many similarities between us it's insane like the whole workout thing the the fitness and recovery like I have been saying for years that fitness and nutrition are the two most underutilized recovery tools there is. I, treatment, therapy, meetings, all that stuff's great. But like you have to rebuild yourself. You have to like rebuild your life. So you see a lot of people in recovery, they turn to food for addiction. They turn to, you know, sex and money and they don't really work on the stuff internally or have healthy coping mechanisms because the number one question I get asked is, well, Doug, like, so you're in recovery and you know, you've got a podcast, you've been on podcasts, like, like, do you, do you never get stressed or anything? I'm like, no, my stress, anxiety, depression, that's all still there. All my memories are still there. It's how I manage it that changes. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the things that I love is I heard you say, like, you know, one of your big goals is just to focus on getting better each day. Right. And um, it's funny on my shirt on the front of my shirt for my, my, uh, my, my t-shirts and hoodies for like my clients and stuff. It says becoming the best version of me. So that's like my thing is like every single day becoming a better version of myself. And, you know, one of the things that I also heard you say that I wanted to really talk about is like relationships in the inner circle, the people you surround yourself with. I know relationships are everything to you. They're everything to me as well. And I, I mean, yes, God, the universe has obviously had a big hand in my success. I've obviously have, you know, done some cool things myself, but the people around me have been what's really helped support and challenge me to so talk about like the people you surround yourself with and how relationships have impacted your life you know i was so funny i, I actually i was i was checking you out uh earlier this morning um 
And you said something on a podcast that I, that was just, I was just like, totally, like, it just, it just, it struck a chord and it, and I, you know, and I've, I've, I think I've heard something like it before, but you said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Mm. And, um, and, and that, that, that couldn't be more true. You know, uh, when I was a kid and when I was, when I was, when I was out there and I was using, I mean, I, I had, I had so many friends, yeah. you know, I had so many friends and, um, and I, I, today I have incredible relationships, right? And so there's a big difference between friends and incredible relationships. I've got two, two guys in Los Angeles that are my brothers. I've got one guy in Moscow, who's my brother. I've got, actually, I've got three guys in Los Angeles, one guy in Moscow, um, and a couple of like close fourth and fifth in the city. A lot of my best friends from childhood and friends that are just like my true true brothers that have left New York. Um, but uh, I, I, I believe that the people you surround yourself with are ultimately um, determine your success as a human, not financially, um, but your happiness levels, right? And so, um, it sucks that my friends are all, the <laughs> majority of them are in California. Uh, but we, we, we spend a lot of time together, um, on, you know, on the phone or, you know, whenever they come visit, I go see them. Um, but you know, my unit is my family right now. Like at this phase in my life, my unit is my family. Uh, my wife is my best friend above all, above all, she's my best friend. Um, and, uh, my kids are my projects and, you know, uh, my, um, and so I focus all my energy on them. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, I, I say it over and over again, the business of business is relationships and the foundation of relationships is trust. Cause I believe that, but I, but I say that in business, but it's also just in general, you know, the 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 business of happiness is relationships and the foundation of relationships is trust it's uh you know um i i i believe relationships are what we um what ultimately gets us uh that satisfaction at the mm -hmm. end of the day and uh you know you can go buy a car you can go buy a house you can go buy a watch you can go buy a pair of sneakers that shit is fleeting it's fun but it's fleeting. Uh, a great relationship, somebody that you can call and completely have full confidence that they are going to support and love you and tell you the truth. It, it's it's that that's the mo that is that that is the the meat and meat and potatoes of life. Um, and uh, and if you have too many of that, too much of that, you have to reassess because I do believe that you know like. There, there should be there should be a crew that's tight that that you feel that way about yeah i mean you're right and i think you know the show me your friends show me your future is so true and the other thing that i like to say is surround yourself with people who have common futures and not common pasts and that's one of the big mistakes i think people make is well you got all these kids you're running around with all these guys when you were using you thought they were your quote unquote friends but they're not aligned with where you're going. So people have a hard time of letting that go. And you really find out who your true friends are when you decide to leave and say, you know what, I'm going to create a different life for myself. You, you find out who comes with you or who supports you, even though they're not there. Not that they're bad people. It's just like you, you start to like really find out that you don't have anything in common with them anymore. That was like one of the things for me is I would, I would try and like do the whole, I'm going to hang out with my friends and not use. But what I found is I was like, well, I'm like talking about eating chicken and, running and they're like talking about like which strain of pot they got or how they're going to score this and score that I was like there's just nothing mm -hmm. in common right and you know there's it's like you want to always for me what's been really helpful like you said to have that core group of people that love support and challenge you unconditionally on top of that I think is not being the smartest person in the room 
And that's how you get the business success, right? Is that you surround yourself with people that are a lot smarter than you. So talk about like some mentors that you've had in your life that have had like a major impact on your success as an entrepreneur and personally too. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll start out by saying like, I am never the smartest guy in the room yeah, <laughs> ever, right? Ever. And, uh, and specifically at, at any of the businesses that I've, that I've helped create or created, um, you know, uh, and that used to, that used to make me feel when I first started as, as a young entrepreneur, you know, whatever, 11 years ago, I used to be insecure about like not being, intellectually you know savvy uh, like others that i was sitting at the table with and now i've grown to love that because right. I'm, I'm just you know like i'm not a great i'm not a, a great numbers guy and but you know i i can uh, i can i can win over anyone you know and that's another that's a it's, a it's another kind of smart and i've had to learn that over time um but uh mentors yeah you know i've got a bunch of great mentors um some really crazy ones and some really, really, uh, you know, like just the quintessential mentor. There's a guy named Richard Corain who um, is Danny Meyer's uh, business partner. He's, he's Danny Meyer's right-hand man in Union Square Hospitality. He's probably just about the best, the best guy I've ever encountered um, in, in general. He's one of the sweetest guys on the planet, most intelligent, uh, and, and also um, emotionally intelligent. Um, and so he's just like this, this unbelievable, you know, sort of resource and friend of mine. Uh, and, and, and early on in my career, he, you know, he, he reached out and said, I love what you're doing. And I said, thank you so much. I, and he's, you know, he's taken every one of my calls and he's always been down to just sit on a, you know, I use him as a soundboard and just have him just, I like to shoot the shit with him. He's just like, I, I always walk away with some incredible information um, from being with him. Uh, and, uh, and then there, then there are some other, you know, there, there's obviously some other business mentors that I have um, that I always run things by this guy, Strauss Zelnick, who's just another sort of like mountain of a, of a businessman and he's he's given me just his undivided attention over the years and helped um help me sort of see through the the, the forest a little bit uh um um and then and then there's there's one, one of the first guys that dragged me into the muay thai gym uh this guy marcus um who uh is a founder of a, a brand called the juice press in New York. And now they're kind of all over the place, but uh, uh, he wasn't the founder of the juice press. Then he was just this crazy Muay Thai, uh, you know, sort of like anti AA slap, but sober guy. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't go to, I didn't go to a, I didn't go to AA or NA. So yeah, I can relate to that a little bit. Oh, cool. Um, you're one of the few. I know. Uh, I yeah, I I, uh, I definitely spent a good amount of years there, um, and uh, and I've certainly you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's actually really really. Uh, yeah, I supported. I supported a hundred percent. Just not. It just wasn't my path, you know. Yeah, yeah. So this guy Marcus, who uh, who I sort of looked up to as an older brother, uh, still do. Um, he's a crazy son of a bitch, but. You know, whenever I'm like going through shit, like, and I want to get like smacked in the mouth and like really told, like, you know, hey, dude, like, look at your fucking part in this thing. Mm. Uh, I call him, and he's just like, you're you're such a punk. Like, you just stop being a baby about it. Just you know, like, give you you know, just just suck it up. Or, you know, he's I I need people like that in my life. I need like really strong editors um, that I know love me and that I love. You know, um, that are just gonna just gonna not co-sign my bullshit, shoot me straight, and um, and so yeah, you know, I think that uh, you, you know, they, they, there's a saying uh, that that you know I think is so uh, it's, it's just I have so much identification in my life where it says your ego is not your amigo, you know, and so if you're not able to put down that pride and ego and ask for help. I think that's the best piece of advice I got early on was like, ask for as much help as possible. 
put your check your ego at the door ask for help no matter what you're doing because if you don't ask for help you're gonna fail and that's okay but the more you fail uh the harder it is to potentially leave your ego at the door so i think the probably one of the most important pieces of the puzzle for me when i was when i was not coming up as a business person, but just like trying to get my life together. It was like, I just literally, I asked for as much help as possible. And, uh, and, and, and I certainly, you know, like made mistakes, but um, that component of asking for help, totally taking to the mentor mentee thing um, and, and surrounding myself with people that were much better than me uh, has, has been a huge, huge catalyst to my success. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think sometimes the the people who have the biggest impacts in our lives are the ones we least expected. You know, I'm sure you've met some amazing celebrity chefs, you know, throughout your career that have helped you, or maybe you've been able to pick their brain and they've given you some guidance and people in the business world. And and you just talked about some people that, you know, you just never expect sometimes, you know, a guy leading you to a Muay Thai gym who now ends up find, founding like one of the, you know, super, you know, big health company. And now obviously you're super passionate about health and fitness. For me, it was my cellmate, you know, looking me in the face when I was in jail and telling me to quit being a victim and to quit blaming everybody else for my problems and take responsibility and knowing that I, I had to take ownership in my choices and to stop, you know, blaming my family or the people who bullied me, all these things. And it was a big wake up call for me because as much as sometimes, you know, we don't want to hear it, it's the times like that, that we need to hear it. And we sit back and you're like, you know what, like, that didn't feel very good to, for that to be said to me, but I really am going to benefit from taking that advice, right? So you've done so much, man, you've run marathons, you've created obviously some amazing um, restaurants, you've rebuilt your life from the depths of despair. Like, what would you say are the top, like two or three lessons you've learned through all this that you kind of would pass on to somebody else if they were to like going through the same kind of you know journey that you are. Um, I think um, if I can do it, you can do it. Mm. Um, there is one massive mountain sitting in the path of between you and your dreams and your goals. And if you want to see what that mountain is, just walk into your bathroom and look at the mirror. And that's that. That's the mountain that uh, that stands in most people's way. And so, once you can get out of your own way and commit to doing what you say you're gonna do, it's so fucking simple. Uh, just do what you say you're gonna do, and that's the way you get. That's the way that mountain never grows past a hill. Mm. Uh, because uh, we are our, our biggest challenge. Um, and I can't tell you the amount of, uh, the, the, the number one question I get, um, you know, in circumstances, scenarios like this or on social media or, you know, in, in an interview or panel, you know, how do you stay motivated? What is it like? Why do you do, how do you, what? And right. my answer to that is, I wake up every single day with a mission and that mm. mission is to try to be a little bit better. And I also know that um, my word is my absolute number one asset. And, uh, it, and that, and that and I'm not saying, you know, in regards to anybody else, for me, when you start, um, when you actually fall off the discipline path yourself, you begin to lose faith and trust in yourself. Mm. Um, and, and of course, other people will lose faith and confidence, you know, the boy that cried wolf stuff. But, you know, not following through with, 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 um, with a commitment is, uh, is human beings, human conditions, number one most problematic fault. And so I've, I've sort of made a conscious decision uh, to stick to what I say I'm going to do. And I think um, once you get into that rhythm, if you say you're going to do something and do it and take it to fruition, 
um, or helps or, or take it to a place where you feel like you can begin to find people to help you take it to fruition. Um, that's when the confidence begins to really start falling into place. Um, it's, it's, it's truly, as far as I'm concerned, that simple. Um, another thing that I think has been really helpful for me um, over time and over years, over the years is there's a big difference between uh, reacting to life and responding to life. Mm. Um, a reaction is, you know, somebody throws a ball at your head and you react like that's just, you know, like, like, I mean, luckily we, we have that ability. Right. Um, but, uh, when somebody says something to you that you don't like, um, and you act on the first thought that comes into your mind, like a reaction, like the ball comes and you just like move out of the way. Somebody says something to you that you don't like and you immediately fire back a, a nasty re reaction. Well, nine out of 10 times that reaction is going to take you to a place where you just don't want to go. Um, and unnecessarily so. And so for me, I've learned over time that, you know, somebody does something that I don't like, or I don't appreciate, or the world is happening around me and I want to control it. And so I can act out on in some way as a reaction to what's happening around me. What I, what I've done and I, and I literally have a practice where something happens I don't like it. That's my first thought. I envision opening up the window, a gust of like cool air, you know, flowing in me taking a deep breath and then letting that reaction go and then deciding when I want to respond. And I do that with emails. I do that in person conversations. I do that at board meetings. I do that with my wife. I do that with my children. I do that constantly. Uh, the react, react respond has been an unbelievable game changer in my life, giving myself time. It doesn't take much, you know, 15 seconds to like cool your jets and not react because I, I just, you know, people react to life and they get put in jail. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. And so, yeah, and you know what I'm saying. So uh, I think that that's a huge component. And then I guess I would leave you with one last thing in terms of that um, sort of advice, you know, question. Um, there's a big difference between listening and waiting to speak. Uh, and um, I've learned to listen. I wasn't always a listener. Um, but as a business owner and, you know, employing 700 people, over my career between the two businesses, I've become more of a therapist and, and a listener than I have uh, a restaurateur. And, uh, and I, would I would never be trusted uh, by my crew of people if I was just waiting to speak to them as opposed to listening to them. Uh, you cannot learn without listening. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't learn without listening. Um, you might be able to learn a little bit by seeing something, but actual long-term um, growth and, and, uh, and, and knowledge comes through listening. And so uh, I would just empower specifically younger, uh, aspiring business people, entrepreneurs, creatives that really want to take their career to the next level. Um, the less you say, the better off you are uh, when it comes to timing, you don't always have to be heard. The more you listen, the stronger you'll be, mm. um, in life, in life, you know, most of the time when I open my mouth, I get into trouble. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, most of the time I open my mouth, I get into trouble. And if I don't have to add anything to the conversation and it's not something that's life or death pressing and I can wait to talk to that person or individual at a, at a later time, maybe after I've given it some, some thought, I, it just, there's, there, you can't go wrong. You just can't go wrong. And I'm not saying be a fucking doormat, but timing is really important and listening is, it's game changing.
Yeah, those three things you just said, the uh, the listening versus waiting to speak, react versus respond, and even like the looking at yourself looking at yourself in the mirror are just like three things. I mean, any no matter where you're at in life, whether you're trying to be an entrepreneur, whether you're trying to beat addiction, whether you're trying to get healthy, whether you're trying what whatever, if you're just getting out of high school, like just applying those yeah. three things is gonna guarantee you massive success because there's a lot of, you know things that can go wrong when you're reacting and you take this golf ball size of a problem and it becomes a bowling ball because of the way you react and respond. So, you know, you've run marathons, you've, um, you're, you know, you're a restaurateur, you've opened up some amazing restaurants, you've competed with Bobby Flay, like you've had your own show. Like, what are you most proud of? Like out of everything you've accomplished, what would you say is like your proudest thing you can look back and be like, you know what, like, I need to give myself a pat on the back for this one. The relationship I have with my wife. Mm. Why? Uh, I mean, I even get emotional thinking about it. I, you know, my wife is, uh, we've been together. I met her six months after I got sober. So we've been together 15 and a half years. Uh, and uh, we have an incredibly healthy relationship. Um, she's taught me so much about patience. She's my she's my, my, my biggest fan. Um, even though sometimes she, you know, is a pain in my ass and doesn't want me to take all the risks I take. Um, but, uh, she's given me an offer. You know, I can, I come from a very, very dysfunctional household, uh, very, very dysfunctional. Um, and so I did not grow up with a good sort of, uh, you know, example of what a marriage looks like. I actually grew up with the exact opposite. Um, and so she's given me this faith and hope and, and um, that, that, that things can be awesome in, 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 in a love relationship and in, in an intimate passion and relationship. Uh, and, uh, and I love, I love her. I love her more than anything. I mean, of course, we have two unbelievable children. So those are massive accomplishments, uh, you know, because I love my boys, but without my wife, they don't exist. And so right. I got to say that, like, my, my, my biggest accomplishment is, is the healthy relationship I have with my wife. You know, if we're, we are very communicative, we, um, she's taught me how to communicate. And she's taught me also that, like, it's okay to feel uncomfortable to say, to say how you feel. Um, and it, you know, I'd rather sit with two to two to four hours of uncomfortable feelings than, you know, bottle it up and, and explode after a month and hate someone. She's taught me that, um, even though we, you know, we're, we're a couple, man, we fucking fight, uh, you know, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but you know, she's, we, we, we've learned about this sort of, we've worked with each other, uh, to really uh, see what a you know to to explore what a healthy relationship looks like, and if and if there's if there's something that we just can't simply can't get through, we we have a great therapist that we call up, and you know uh, she'll take a she'll take a phone interview a phone session with us, and super not ashamed of that. Like feel like it's a great healthy thing to incorporate into a marriage. You have a you have a third party that can help you navigate and uh, you know, and, and we don't have to use her often, but when we do, it's awesome. Um, I just think it's the best thing I've ever done. My, my, my relationship with my wife. I think it's, you know, I like, I, I, I think it's the greatest accomplishment for me. Yeah. What do they say behind every great man's a great woman, right? And that the old adage and, you know, and I'm sure that's vice versa, obviously too, but you know, it's just funny you say that because, you know, I think, you know, relationships are everything, right? And you you said it throughout the show that like, doesn't the business, business is awesome and the accomplishments, but what really matters is the relationships you have interpersonally and that being with your wife and what you've built. And the fact that you are open and be like, we don't have like the, the perfect relationship. We fight and, but we work shit out and we get uncomfortable um, with our conversations. And as men, I think we're afraid to, to open up and share our emotions. We're taught to kind of hold everything back. And really like what that has caused is it's caused a ton of relationship problems because people explode and people don't communicate. And so I just love your honesty and vulnerability about that. So 
Um, the one thing I want to ask you now is like we talked before the show and you said you sold, um, you got out of like a bunch of equity, I think, right. From your, mm-hmm. some of your companies that have been able to position you in a place right now where you have some freedom. What are you working on now? Is it something in the food business? Is it something in any of your podcasts? Like what's next for you? Um, well, I mean, it's interesting, obviously with this COVID, you know, I, I have a pivot mentality and I think right. that most entrepreneurs, um, and successful people in business have to have this pivot mentality, which means, you know, when you think about a pivot in basketball, um, you have a strong leg that you stand on and the other leg is just moving around and it's comfortable moving around. It's comfortable going fo- you know, left, right, fo- back, you know, but there's always that strong leg that you stand on your foundation. And so for me, the pivot mentality is essentially like, I know what I'm good at. Um, and I can apply that in many different ways. And I'm able to pivot quickly because I, I feel confident in, in what I know I, I'm good at. And that is connecting with human beings. And so, uh, you know, I was building a business in the city, which was, which was called Creatures of Habit. It was ultimately going to be a restaurant concept that was going to use the restaurants um, as an incubator for a lot of consumer packaged Mm. goods in the wellness space. And so now that opening up a restaurant in New York City is not something that I think anybody's necessarily running to do at this time. Uh, I'm going to flip flop it and create a couple of great products that I will launch uh, under the Creatures of Habit brand um, that are in the wellness um, in the wellness space that are direct to consumer and um, and awesome and convenient. Uh, so I'm going to start with that. That's a project I'm working on. I'm obviously working on my my podcast. Um, and now that I'm upstate, deeply considering opening up a restaurant up here. That's awesome. I, mean, I feel like you're somebody that like I could just hang out with for hours. Like I swear, like when we get off, I'm going to have to figure out how, how I can stay in touch with you because. Um, I'd love to like grab a workout or even like have a meal or something together and just cause I can, totally, like, man. you I know, the same way. um, and I really appreciate your time today, man. And so where can people find out more about you? I mean, I know you're active on Instagram at Michael Chernow, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. Like where can people find out more about what you got going on? You can just pop on my, my website, michaelchernow.com. You can check out my, my podcast born or made with Michael Chernow, um, to, 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 you know, stay up to date with all the, the daily stuff I'm doing. Uh, Instagram is really my jam. So Instagram uh, at Michael Chernow is where I, I'm most active. Um, and, uh, you know, I do a lot of fitness and cooking and family vibes on, on my Instagram account. So it's, it's a fun way to, to, to hang with me. That's awesome. I don't know. Your story is just so amazing and how humble you are through it. And it reminds me of, I'm sure you know who Andrew Zimmern is. Um, Good buddy of mine. I interviewed Andrew for uh, my book, The Heart of Recovery, and his story is very, very similar, right? He um, he got into recovery and then created this amazing business, right? And, and now he's giving back, helping others, super passionate about just the you know, recovery community. And, and I could see your exact same, like your kind of life was falling apart in New York too. Right. And kind of rebuilt it and now became this incredible guy. So dude, once again, thank you so much for hopping on here, man, man. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And um, I really appreciate you thinking of me for it. Yeah. And those that are listening, you know, be sure to check out Michael, be sure to check out the restaurants, send him a DM. um, If this, if this episode resonated with you, because you know, it's people like him that are, being a light in this world during this dark time that is going to help us kind of all collectively as a country kind of bounce back from this. So, you know, make sure to take some notes also on the things he shared, his lessons learned, how he got through the adversity, because it's so practical to be able to apply no matter where you are in your life. And I think sometimes we, we take these moments of stress and adversity and we make them worse based on how we respond. So make sure to heed, you know, his advice and, and, and take, um, some risks in changing the way, um, you respond to a lot of these situations. So, once again, as always, if this really, you know, took a toll in your heart and you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star review. We would love to hear from you. And once again, you're listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and we will see you next time.